Hello everyone. We are now at the end of the year pretty much. We are pretty much one or two live streams away from the finale. I'm gonna flip this on and see what this does. Hey, I actually like that. Yeah, I think I'll leave that on. Hi Victoria. Let's put me on here. Alright, so hello pickle boy hello johan alex i know i am four minutes late i was trying to kind of set things up and i'm curious what the sound is going to be last week the sound kept going in and out and uh i think i had it set up to cancel ambient noise in the background so i made sure that's disabled this time so you may hear a lot of aquarium type noises i don't know what you're getting and i'll play it back later on and see what happens but hopefully it, it's a uh it's better. It doesn't go down and go up. And I want to do a quick update on last week because we had a weird thing happen with my Vortec pump, which has not happened again since. It only happened during the stream. And I'm wondering if my wireless microphone is on the same frequency as the wireless of my Vortec. Because it hasn't messed up since. It hasn't done anything. I haven't even touched it. It's run completely right. Alex, welcome to the stream and being here while it's actually live. Okay, so today's topic is about light racks. What else? I feel like there's other things I wanted to mention before we got started. But of course, now that I'm in front of the camera, I can't think. I th believe... <clears throat> yeah, maybe it'll come to me later. I don't know. So, I wanted to talk about my light rack because I have been, <clears throat> sorry, I have been using the same one for many, many years. I see Howard's already trying to throw me off track. I'll throw this on the screen really quick, because why not? The replacement blades, um, that might be an Amazon thing that you could find possibly, but uh, I'm using something new on occasion, and I got this from Flipper. And you actually use credit cards or hotel key cards and put them in there and then turn them around. You can even use them lengthwise in here and scrape in a tiny spot. So I got this uh, when I was at Reefa Palooza. It's pretty cool. I actually have this guy on my uh, website now, I think. <laughs> Maybe I forgot to add it. So it might be on my website be, you know, later on today. I have a few of these in stock in case anyone else wanted to get one. But the handle's nice and rigid and I'm sure it's going to come in different lengths at some point, but this is the one they sell right now. And you just put it in your own card as much as you want. And the nice thing is you're not going to scratch the glass or the acrylic with that. Okay. Howard, we're done with you. <laughs> Light racks. I'm going to show you mine. <clears throat> Why is it there's always something in my throat? Okay. So up here you can see I've got a framework with metal halides and then you see the XHOs. And I know it's really, really bright, and that's on purpose. I mean, I had I turned on all the lights for this stream. <clears throat> this light rack is completely movable, and there's a couple of rails that are screwed into the joists of the ceiling. So I'm going to be able to pull this toward me. And I did this... Let's see what I look like. So bright. Uh, I did this back in 2011 and i wanted the ability to work on my lighting above my you know above my head but not over the tank so like right now here's the edge of the tank and i actually believe i could pull this a little bit further watch this crash on me and kill me and that'll be the end of the stream there's a limit on my wire because i've got a a wire over here for my atk going to a power bar eight so I'm gonna take you guys up here and show you the light rack. So you can see my pendants and you can see the ballasts. And I'm gonna tilt you, I can't help it. You're just gonna have to deal. Another ballast. And then way over there, you can see the power bar eight. And that is the extent of my wire. I can't stretch this any farther for you guys. But that power bar eight is connected with an Aquabus cable all the way over to my apex brain that is way down there all right 
Now, why did I do this? Well, if I had to take out this pendant and bring it down, I wanted to do it over air, not over the tank, because it's just so hard to contort your body that way. And I felt like if I could turn around, if I could go ahead and remove this safely, clean the glass, put it back in, that was a lot smarter than leaning over a tank trying to do that. And when you're loosening the screws to take the metal halide bulbs out, those screws could fall in the water and land in the reef and maybe not even be found. So I decide, or it's actually a wing nut. So I decided, let me just do all this stuff off tank. And then when I'm done, roll it back into place. The other benefit, and I'll show you this as well. Now when I want to work on my tank, I have lots of space. It's a little dirty. I got to clean up some salt creep. But you can see I've got the space to work on my tank, and I really do appreciate that. And I can be leaning in from the far right side of your screen and working from the front of the tank, or I could be here on the back side, which you kind of saw when we removed all the corals from my tank back in uh, September of 2017. We took out uh, all those huge colonies, and we moved their light rack out of the way to reach in, lift up, and pass the corals down to other people. You saw some of that. So that was my main reason. Easy access to the tank, which I already feel like I have easy access because look how far it is from the lights down to the edge of the tank. I mean, that, that distance right there is probably about 12 inches or so. And you know, occasionally I kind of think maybe I should have taken the light rack and lowered it one inch closer to the water so that I could, you know, maybe get a little bit more light. You know, because PAR is all about having tons of power, you know, and having lots of light intensity in your tank. Now, right now, the tank is being lit completely with 10K lighting. These are all Reef Bright Twin Arc bulbs. They're inside Lumen Bright uh, octagonal, is that right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, octagonal reflectors. I've had these reflectors forever, probably coming up on 10 years. I had them over my 280 gallon. And when I set up the 400, they went over this tank because they were still in perfect shape. I just have to take them down from time to time and clean the glass and reinstall them. Now, the light rack itself, I, the reason I want to talk about it today, and it's going to be kind of a commercial for EasyTube, it's going to make them a little bit richer because you might want to buy EasyTube. So it's easytube.com. It might be easy-tube.com. I haven't been to the website in years. But what you do is you say, I want aluminum or I want steel. And I want these plastic connectors and they have corner connectors and they have T-shapes and you just hammer it together with a rubber mallet and boom, you've got a frame. So if you had a tank with a canopy around it and you, know, you lift the front of the canopy and now you've got, you know, the ends are still intact and the top is still there, you can actually put a couple of rails inside there and you could slide the easy tube in with all your lights on and you could pull it out as far as you wanted. I mean, that might be something you find appealing. If you have a big tank built in wall and you want a way to raise the lights up and down because your ceilings were higher than mine, you could use easy tube as well. And then finally, up on my ceiling, I have these tracks and I'll find you guys the link to the stuff. I, I did all the, I blogged about this years ago, but these tracks came from a different company. I think McMaster car is the name of it. Anyway, I'll find the links. I'll put them in the video description later. I, they, I ordered the track. And then the little roller guides. These are, let's see, can you see? Ah, how do I do this? I can't get close enough. Hang on, hang on, let me fix this. <laughs> I'm gonna get really, really close in there, I hope. So you can see the roller right there. And then I added threaded rod. The threaded uh, steel rod, this right here going straight down, that's just something from Home Depot. And it was silver colored, you know, the color of metal. And I spray painted it black eight years ago and the black paint has held on, you know, no rust, no surprises. And then there's a little nut at the bottom that you probably can't, I don't know, Let's see if we can see this. There's so much light here. I don't know if I can do this. Do this. No. Yep. See, there's the nut right there. You can barely make it out. So that was how I connected at the base. Super easy. Uh, like I said, I've got a blog about it. So what I shall do, I get this camera set again. What I'll do is I will put the links to everything. So you can look at how I built it and uh, where I got the parts from. And then if you find any of this beneficial and you think it could help you with your tank, you'll know where to order it.
And yes, that is, I said you might make them a little richer. It has nothing to do with me. They don't even know I'm doing this. It was my crazy idea. Let's talk about EasyTube today. EasyTube, like I said, comes in aluminum, which is lighter, or steel. So my rack is mostly made of aluminum, except for the bar I grabbed to pull it back. I wanted that to be steel because I didn't want it to bend. I was afraid, you know, you're pulling a really heavy rack and maybe it'll flex or bend. So I put a steel tube on the front here on this side and then the front of the opposite side for working from that side. I don't even remember what I paid. It wasn't a lot. And the nice thing is they'll cut everything the exact size you want and ship it to you ready to go. And you can just hammer it together, like I said, with a rubber mallet. If you prefer to cut it all yourself, if you're obsessive that way and you said, no, 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 I don't trust you. You can cut it yourself with um, like a jigsaw with a metal cutting blade. Uh, and, uh, but then you have to deburr everything also. You gotta file the edges. They do all that for you. So they'll cut it, they'll deburr it, and everything's in there. It's awesome. So I do really recommend EasyTube in that regard because it's super convenient. And a friend of mine named Wes is the one that told me about it in the first place. And he and I have been using it ever since, of course. I mean, once I built it, I never touched it again. Now, you might say, well, what about the weight? What's your situation? How much can it handle? I th I'm trying to go off of memory here, but I believe the rolling track on the ceiling could handle 80 pounds of track because that track is made of aluminum. And my entire light rack, the full length, I mean, the rack was about 20 pounds, and then each pendant was 20 pounds, so that puts me at 80. And then you add those ballasts. So I'm probably easily at 100 to 110 pounds of weight sitting on top of that rack. And like I said, I've been running this, I've been using it since I installed it in 2011. So we're coming up on eight years. And I've rolled it back and forth hundreds of times. And it's, uh, it's really, I mean, it's super convenient. So I wanted to tell you guys about that because I thought maybe you'd like it. Now there's other material uh, that you can buy uh, I think it's called 2080 and some people use that and they bolt it together and these are for the stand for the aquarium to sit on Potentially if that's what you wanted to get and you couldn't get easy to maybe 2080 would work to make some kind of a framework that you then suspend from your ceiling somehow uh, I've chosen this system and it worked out really really well for me a matter of fact the anemone cube that you guys love so much It's actually easy tube as well and I've literally extended or gone beyond what that stand can handle I chose steel again for the entire thing, but I've got 600 pounds sitting down on top of that thing and it, it wiggles. I'm, I'm cautious around it, but it's also been like that for five years with no surprises. But um, yeah, I think I took it a little bit too far. I think a smaller tank would have been smarter for that one. I mean, it was super easy to assemble. I put wood on the outside to kind of help it from racking and it did its job. But I'd probably suggest maybe 40 gallons or smaller if you're gonna copy that crazy idea of mine. So, uh, did that help you at all? Is there any questions you have? Let me jump into the chat and I'm gonna look at this instead of looking at uh, that camera. So, come back to this one. Alrighty. I'm gonna scroll back up to the top and get past all the hellos. I see someone's here from Belgium. Uh, and Merry Christmas, everyone. Yes, we're almost there. It's almost time. And hello to Birmingham. Okay, uh, Lamont is saying that the threaded rod is zinc plated. Uh, I don't know, yes or no. You could be 100% right. And I remember it was kind of tricky to paint. I think I cleaned it with something to get all the oil off of it. And then I spray painted it and spray painted it and spray painted it over and over and over. Because I was trying to seal in uh, the threads and hopefully not let them rust over my tank. If you're saying zinc doesn't allow it to rust, maybe that's great. I, I don't know the answer to that. I was just being paranoid and uh, it's worked out really, really well. I haven't had to like repaint it or anything, which is nice. But like I said, I've considered buying longer threaded rod and maybe replacing one corner at a time because there's four of those total. And that way I could maybe bring the entire light rack down one more inch, uh, a little bit closer to the water. Not really a necessity, but I kind of thought maybe a little bit more light in my tank might help, you know? Okay. Hey, no questions. All right, um, I also have an idea that I haven't tried. So we're gonna try it live here. So you know, you guys know I make these things. And, uh, sorry, here. So this is a top-down floater box. 
and it's a little dirty. Dang it. I just happen to have a handy Apex towel here. So let's see if I can get off these spots here really quick. I threw it in the sink and then I, dry, I threw it on the drying rack. I didn't actually dry it. So I was thinking maybe we could put the webcam inside this guy and show you some corals from above today. I will. I will post the URLs to everything that was used for the light rack. So, dude, there's like a water line. See, I let this, okay, let me teach you, tell you a lesson. Don't put this thing in your tank and leave it there for days like I did. I used it the other day and forgot and it was sitting against the surface of the water. There's actually a water line on there I gotta clean off now. Ruined my beautiful box. Yeah, whatever, all right. So, we got our box. I'm gonna put it right in there. Now we're gonna try and grab this webcam. Like I said, this may or may not work. I have no idea. I think I'm gonna take it off of its base. Hmm. Whoops, that made it top heavy. All right, now let's see what happens. Hey, hey, we have a top-down view, and there's Spock. She's such a whale. Hi, Spock. All right, so <laughs> obviously I can only go as far as the cord will allow, but I thought it would be kind of fun to show you some corals from above under 10K lighting, not the blue stuff you guys are so used to. Let's see what happens here. So there is a red acro I got from uh, from Dwayne. Why wouldn't it focus? Why wouldn't it focus on the coral? I'm so demanding, right? Maybe it's too close to the camera. There's a lime in the sky. There is the quad color. There's something unknown that's bluish. It must be an acro. There's a green acro I got from Oh Too Many Fish in California and a blue tort. There's some Montipora down below and a whole bunch of Devil's Hand, which I can't believe I have that in my tank again. A couple of Dendros, a Bird's Nest. The Grape Monty is taking over again. This right here has blue polyps, which you barely can see in blue lighting, but they're actually pretty awesome. And then we've got kind of a... The, the colors are not very pretty right now. Uh, this one's kind of a peach colored Montipor, I'd say. Some shadow caster, a nice chalice hiding down low. And there's a whole piece of sunset monopora. And there's a whole bunch of Drew's acro. I might have to lift this up a little bit. I don't know if it's gonna happen here. So Drew's acro. There's a big old piece of milka. My yellow scroll coral in the front of the tank. Well, the middle of the tank. There's an Acan. There's uh, another Chalice, another Monty, a whole bunch of Lobos. Isn't this a great way to spend your Saturday? <laughs> and then way over here, if the wire will stretch, my Skunk Clownfish inside the Sea Bay Anemone. And then we've got a Toadstool Leather down there. I'm going to try and tilt this a little bit. Some hammer coral. And that's as far as I can reach. All right. I thought that might be kind of fun today. This bird's nest is doing really, really well. See all the sharp pointy tips? It shows healthy growth. And this is also a montipora right here. It's called elkhorn montipora. Not a lot of people have it. Uh, speaking of the things a lot of people do not have, let me take this off of here. A lot of people don't have this coral either. It's called, um, uh, why can't I think of its name? Blue Ridge. Blue Ridge Coral. And when you break that coral in half inside, it's blue. That's why it's called Blue Ridge. And then in here, I've got a a favia that I like to call a beehive because of its shape. It's actually spreading. It's trying to get onto that rock over there, which is kind of funny to me. All right, 
So that's kind of it. There's a, a new coral I got not too long ago called Samacora. And there's a big old chalice and Monty and Monty and Monty and Monty and my huge tongue coral. Here's my coffee cup for a sense of scale. And there's a really nice Fabia down there that just refuses to do anything interesting, but it also doesn't die. And then we got some more Monty. Here's the computer. <laughs> Inception. All right, that's it. Let me uh, put this back on here. Uh, I'll switch cameras so you don't have to look at that. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, let's see, someone says, is there a means to stopping STN? Yes, <laughs> there actually is. STN stands for slow tissue necrosis. And it's typically what we see corals going through as they're slowly dying from the bottom up, usually. And historically, the whole reason for STN in the past was because alkalinity swings were happening, water parameters jumped, and so your corals start to suffer. So the very first thing you want to do is, number one, check every bit of your water parameters and then double check it, which means test everything twice and then even take a, a cup of your water to the fish store and have them test everything and verify their numbers to your numbers and make sure all your numbers are the same. If their numbers are radically different from yours, then maybe your test kits are bad and need to be replaced. And I am from the school of when something is dying, I don't touch it. And I know there's others out there that say, oh, yeah, if that's happening, you've got to frag it immediately. And I just feel like you're putting the coral through too much stress when you do that. So I usually leave it alone, pray, <laughs> just hope for the best, and, and feel that if any part of it will survive, I can start again from that piece. So the bottom of my really pretty quad color acro, the bottom two inches went completely white in one day. That's not RTN. I mean, it's close, but it really was STN. And I checked alkalinity and alkalinity on my tank had dropped. And so I went ahead and I got it back up where it belonged and the white stopped too. It didn't keep spreading. But the bottom half of that coral is bone white. It's really depressing. Every time I see it, it bugs me because it was all alive with tissue and polyps and now it's bone white. But you know, it just is what it is. I mean, you know, sometimes accidents happen. So we want to stay on top of things and avoid that. If you are from the school where you feel you've got to go ahead and frag, you can. But like I said, what you're doing is you're handling it you're cutting it, you're putting it in a new spot with new neighbors, different flow, different amount of light than it was getting before, and what's left may not survive all the ordeal of what you just put it through. That's why I just leave it alone as long as possible. And then whatever survives, at that point, you know, it's had a couple of weeks to kind of settle down and not be so prone to be sick, let's call it. Then at that point, you could go ahead and you can cut off what you wanted, remove the dead and put it where it was. You know, basically, the bottom part that died, cut it off, and then put the coral right back where it was and start fresh. And that does two things. Number one, it gives the coral a chance to start growing really, really quickly again. And the second thing it does is it maintains all of the same parameters it's always had. Same lighting, same flow, same neighbors. And the best part is that you're no longer upset because what bothered you is gone. So I would definitely remove that part that bothers you and just get it where, you know, kind of, it brings the horizon down in your tank a little bit. So there's room for growth above for it to grow upward again. That would be my thought. All right, that was a really long answer to your question. Um, Blue Ridge, someone asked, is it really that common? It's, uh, it's actually uncommon, and yet some people have it, but you never see it in a fish store. So usually you're getting it from another hobbyist, somebody that's been in the hobby a really long time. So uh, I've, had, I've had it forever. I've had it since 2003, and it came on some rock of a tank I bought used, and I gave away a bunch of it. And in this tank, I put in a nugget. I stuck it on there and now it's spread to about this big across. It's a very slow grower. And for me, it's kind of a boring brown, but at the same time, you know, I've got a connection with it, you know, an emotional connection. I've had it for a long time, but I've seen it only once where it's like in what I, let's call it full bloom. All the polyps came out of it and it looked like it was covered in snow. I was like, that is amazing. What coral is that? And they said, that's Blue Ridge. And I'd never seen it like that before, but there was this fish store in Louisiana. They had a huge colony and it was just completely covered in white polyps. It looked amazing. And I, I'm kind of jealous that mine doesn't do that. Um, Glenn asked a great question. 
So he says, I like that your SPS are with soft corals, and you know, is it safe to keep them together without chemical warfare? And actually, yeah, chemical warfare is a real thing. And when you run a mixed reef like I do, one of the solutions, obviously, number one, you want to have really good uh, filtration. But one of the beneficial solutions or tricks, I guess I could say, is to run some carbon on your tank from time to time to remove the chemical warfare from the water. That being said, I, oh, my, I, my, hand, I, my tank is hands-free. I don't mess with it a lot. Let me switch cameras here just for fun. And we'll tilt this down a little bit. Give you guys something to look at besides me. It looks so blue. What happened? Oh, maybe I'm trying to see if it's the XHOs that are doing it. Try this, and then we'll try tilting this down. Weird, because the tank's not blue at all. I think it's just the XHOs are hitting the camera frame. Um, so, I do run carbon on occasion. I put in about a half a cup per 50 gallons. And so in my case, that's uh, you know around two and a half cups of carbon in my reactor. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> no. It must be more. And I fill up the reactor with some carbon. I rinse it really well. I hook it up to my manifold and I let the flow go through it. And after, you know, a few days, it's really it's done its job. It's not going to keep going. It's it's fed up. So, <clears throat> what I do is I eventually get around to replacing it. But I don't feel that running carbon non-stop is beneficial. I definitely don't think that carbon lasts for a month like a lot of people believe. But yes, running a mixed reef has been something I've always enjoyed. I like the diversity. I like that I have the ability to have hammer corals and anemones and, and leathers as well as SPS. Nicole, you just told me why my Blue Ridge never opens up. Apparently my water sucks. <laughs> and it's full of nitrate, maybe that's why. All right. <clears throat> yeah, these top-down boxes like you saw me showing earlier in the video, I call them smartphone floaters because you can actually lay your phone in it. I'm going to switch cameras again here for a second. So you can put your, your phone. Do I have my phone on me? I do. You can just set your phone right inside the box, and then you'll be able to take pictures. You know, you'd be able to film or take pictures right through the base. And I put legs on here so when you put it down on the countertop or on anything, it won't scratch the viewing panel, which is really important. I sell those on my website. They're $39 plus shipping. So if that's something interesting to you, then buy one and make me a little bit richer. I have had some really good months uh, financially, thanks to you guys. And I really do appreciate that you're buying things from my website, which is milosreef.com. I know a lot of people don't associate a YouTube channel with a business necessarily. They kind of just watch the videos and they don't really think about the backbone that makes it all work. And Milo's Reef is how I make a living. <laughs> and this is my full-time gig. I literally spend every day educating people and teaching them and helping them and filling their orders. And so all the people that have been buying from me over the last few months have helped me get this tooth that's in my mouth now. And I still have one more to go, unfortunately. And that's going to start next month. But in the meantime, you guys have helped me and I really, really appreciate it because I paid the bills and I took care of oral surgery uh, thanks to you guys. So thank you. And I, I do like that after I do a YouTube video, about 10 new orders roll in over the next 24 to 48 hours, which is really, you know, I can, I can see YouTube is leading to the sales, which is kind of neat. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's nice. And I tend to talk about other people's products. Like I was pushing EasyTube today. I don't really talk about my own stuff as much. And uh, maybe you guys like that. I don't know. I, I hate to be advertised to, but at the same time, I got to eat. So, all right. Somebody put water test Sunday. Is it Sunday where you are? It's Saturday. So we have water test Saturday today. We need to do all our water tests. Reef Trace has released a brand new version of their app again for the iPhone. The Android version is gonna come out in uh, January, I believe. And I want to show you, hmm, where is it? So one of the newest things they did, uh, there's the app right there. Don't read my notifications. 
<laughs> there's my app right there. And you can log in or you can log in with Facebook. And I've been using login with Facebook forever. But if you log in with an email address and a password, now on the iPhone, you can use Face ID and it'll, you just look at it and logs you right in. Unfortunately for me, I use Facebook login and there's no way to tether those together. So I've asked them to find a way to bridge it because I would like to use Face ID to log in. And that way I don't lose all my data that I've been storing in here for the last two years. Now, I'm gonna log in really quick and I wanna show you something new. All right, I am logged in. So, let's see if this works. Yep. All right, on the screen would be some parameters possibly, and then down on the bottom here is a little plus sign. Click that, and now you've got some new features. And I love the way that looks. So it says share results, parameter guide, quick log, and custom filters. Custom filters should have been in here the whole time. It would have been so much better. So we touched that. Then you pick what you're gonna show on your chart and your date range. And a lot of people never understood date range, how important that was. You can actually touch a spot and then pick the month, the, the time, even the year, and then hit update and it will scan all of the data for that item from that period. And then you hit done. And it would show that date range. So that's an important one. And so I like that they put that in where it says customize filters, it's more obvious. But what's really cool is this new thing called quick log because now you can enter all of your parameters all at once on one screen and hit save and not have to do each one one by one. And that is gonna be super good for you power users that are doing a lot of water tests and you wanna just knock them out really quick. If you wanna do the old method of picking one item and then do, you know, pick the test kit, pick the, the value, enter the number, save the date, you know, that, you can do that. But I wanted a quick log and quick log is gonna make it super simple super simple to do that. So I'm excited about that. And so that will be coming out in the newest version of Reef Trace. And you just look at the Reef Trace app in the App Store and you'll find it if you don't have it. It's like $3.99. Um, okay, this is a fun question. Why did you decide to go with a sea bay anemone? I chose a sea bay anemone because someone sold it to me as a funny looking BTA. And I thought, oh, I love BTAs, I'll take it. And I brought it home and I put it in the tank with all the anemones and it wasn't doing well. And it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So I took it out and put it in my reef and it has become this beast of an anemone. And it actually is a, a sea bay anemone. It's really, really nice. So, and uh, I like, it's look, it's really pretty. It just, you know, it kills a lot of stuff in its vicinity. Let's see. Try to switch to that one. You can kind of see it right there. Oh, okay, Patrick it was talking about water test Sundays because he works on Saturdays. Fair enough. The important part is testing our water every single week. And when you don't and things start going to crap, then you spend all this time and money trying to fix only because you're lazy. So definitely test your water. Um, here's an interesting comment. I think T5s are the best for reefs, but you can use a combo of both with T5s and LEDs. And I, I think you may be talking to someone else at the same time. You know, you're not just throwing this thought into the air, so to speak. Uh, I have used VHOs, T5s, Power Compacts, Metal Halides, LEDs. I've used them all. And I still love my Metal Halides with LEDs over the reef. I've got LEDs over my Refugium. I've got LEDs over my Frag system. I've got LEDs over the Anemone Cube. I did T5s briefly when they were first coming out. They, you know, they weren't amazing back then. They were okay. And they're still kind of tricky to set up. You can buy them and you can set up the, the color you like, but that's the thing. You might say, oh, I wish it had a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. And so you have to add like a pink bulb with a blue bulb, with a white bulb, with a purple bulb. <laughs> And you, you have to find this right combination of bulbs to get the look you like for your entire tank. And on top of that, you also need to be able to put them in the correct order. Like for example, if you were, I'm just gonna compare this very simplistically. If you had only white bulbs and blue bulbs, 
I would say put the blue bulbs in front of you and the white bulbs behind it so you're looking through a bath of blue and that will get you the right look. If you put the white in the front and the blue in the back, your tank won't look right. So I believe similarly with T5s, you're gonna need to kind of get them in the right order from blue to violet to purple to pink to white to yellow, you know, all the way back to get that look that you enjoy. But T5s are really good at spreading light equally. A funny thing about T5s and measuring PAR is that when you set up your, your uh, you put your meter in the water and you're measuring, the PAR numbers don't budge under T5s. They are the same number all the way across. It's crazy looking. Where with metal halides and with LEDs, you watch the numbers jump up and down uh, like a, well, faster than a heartbeat. <laughs> but I mean, they, they ricochet all over the place. And with T5s, you just get like a locked number. It's very interesting. Hello, Mike B. I can't believe you made it to the live stream. Yeah, see, I thought that uh, AMA Aquatics was talking to someone specifically. Uh, I do want to mention this in case you did not know it. Uh, put me back on the screen for a second. This is probably boring you guys to tears, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sure you love looking at the reef more than me. T5 bulbs from Reef Bright are specifically tuned to not get as hot as regular T5 bulbs. So if you're thinking about getting T5s, I would always point people to Reef Bright because the bulb isn't as hot. You can actually touch it without getting fried. And that means the bulb will last longer too. So that's a, a really good selling point when it comes to buying things. Yeah. If you're uh, thinking that's the route you want to go, I would definitely check out uh, Reef Bright. All right. See, I gave them some more love. I give them love all the time because I really like their product line. No more questions? You guys are out of questions this week. It's surprising. Let me point you another part of the reef while we're waiting for something interesting to happen here. Maybe we'll just wrap up the live stream early. That spot looks really blown out. I wonder if... Hmm. See how white? It's so crazy white. It shouldn't be that blown out. It looks fine to me. It'll back up a little bit. How's that? Not much better. It's actually worse. Hmm. Where are all the fish? They're over there. Oh, here's one way over here. One. <laughs> Mike B says he had a buddy bring over a Kessel 360 to put next to his 250 watt metal halide luminarch and wanted to see if the blue would make a difference. Couldn't even tell the difference. I believe that. Metal halides are very powerful. And when I was first testing out uh, some LEDs instead of VHOs, I could not tell the difference with my tank. I, I was just like, you know what? I'm not gonna give up my VHOs. But then when these guys came out, those strips right there by Reef Bright, they're called XHOs. I was wrong. They are fantastic for this. And these are the completely blue ones. Matter of fact, I don't know if you can tell in this video, but if you look really closely at the blue, they aren't all the same blue. They kind of look like they're blue, violet, blue, violet, blue, violet, blue, violet. At least that's what it looks like to my eyeballs. And I think that combination, that magical spectrum right there is what makes my reef look so pretty with XHOs and every day my XHOs turn on and they are the only thing on before the metal halides and the tank is just gorgeous and then when I switched you know when the metal halides come on you know it just fills it in nicely it doesn't look too this is all white lighting right now but yet all the corals look right to my eye they may not look good on a webcam but to the human eye they look really good while we are just hanging out here why don't I turn off all these metal halides for a second we're probably going to regret this because it's gonna make everything blue. There you go, there's some blue for you guys. And you can kind of, let me turn off this light too. So you got some glowiness. And I probably should put my little lens clip on there now at this point. But then I'm gonna switch the metal halides on again in a minute to the, uh, to the 20K version. I see that my battery for my 
wireless mic is blinking, which means we may lose sound at some point here. Just a heads up. Let me see if I can find that clip really quick. Up oh, there it is. Oh, <laughs> silly me, we're not using my phone. I'll just hold this in front of the lens for a second. There's some pretty color, see? Filtered out the blue. So I'm using the, the lens that goes on the uh, Coral View lens from Polyp Labs. But I'm having to hold it there because it's threaded and it does not hold onto a webcam. <laughs> So, all right, that's it. Sorry, I'm gonna have to put you back to blue mode. And we're gonna turn our metal halides back on. And this time we should get all 20K lighting instead of 10K lighting. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll switch back to me. I see questions. All right, good, good. Let me jump up here. Dylan Roberts asks, what's the best T5 lamps for color color? That is part of what we were talking about before. And you're going to have to literally talk to people that own T5s to find out what works best. Let me do this also, kind of wash out some of that blue. Then uh, someone asked here, what's the favorite part of my reef? I think the SPS corals. I love LPS, but I look at the SPS. Uh, ooh. This person asked, is a 7K or 7,000 Kelvin LED with full actinic okay if PAR is high enough? Man, 7,000 Kelvin would be so hideous. You would just have to throw in so much blue to help clean that up. I don't know. I don't know if you'd like that. Here's the tank under 20K and combined with um, the XHOs. And here we are filtered out a little bit. But you see it, it doesn't look as pretty, obviously, because we're getting a combination of lighting right now. And we're dealing with a webcam. So anyway, I think we're done with webcamming this part. I think we'll stick to me at this point. I wonder if this is a good idea. Let's turn this. It's probably a terrible idea. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um... Ooh, good question here. So I want to put my light canopy in a drawer slide so I can pull it out of the way when working on the tank. Where can I find slides that are closed at 12 inches and extend to 36? Uh, that's kind of one of those things that you're going to shop probably at Home Depot or so forth. And I've seen that exact setup done in the past. And it was actually really cool. The, what they did was they have the solid canopy over the tank and then they have a front face like the front of a drawer and they put the slides going in and they mounted the lights. The only downside was you had to pull the drawer out towards you and then you had to duck under it to get your head inside to work in your tank and then you had to duck under so you didn't hit the back of your head, tunk, you know, and get under it and then you slide it shut. But it was a really neat system. I've only seen it done twice. So, and then the other thing you have to think about, the roller, the tracks you're thinking about using, they're sitting in a very moist environment all the time with salt and uh, you'll probably just have to replace those as they rust out on you. I mean, I know you could oil them, but then you don't want the oil to drip down on the rim of the tank and drip into the water as well. So I think you're probably at some point going to have to just replace it. Now, going from 12 to 36, don't know if you can quite pull that off. But if you could go 12 to 30, that might be enough. 36 is quite the distance. And keep in mind, too, now you've got this thing sticking out so far with lights in it. Could that pull the canopy over? You know, would it be front heavy? That's a concern. I can tell this person, Gianni, uh, if you want to have a light rack like the Easy Tube and have a pulley system bring it up, try to find a pulley system that pulls all sides up at the same time. I've seen people use something that looks like it's meant to pull a bicycle to the ceiling, but those things do like kind of a weird zigzaggy thing. 
And when you pull, what happens is part of the bike goes up and then you keep pulling and the other half kind of comes up and your lights are doing this weird wonky thing and they never hang flat. I, I don't like that. So I would much rather have like doubles pull equally, you know, like tie the rope with a knot so it's the same length like you do with a mini blind. And then when you pull it all, you know, a mini blind, you want to go, you don't want the mini blind to go up like this and then catch up. You want your lights also to rise equally. So I would want to have double pulleys and then you could, you know, if you're, if you have a nice big room like I do, you could have pulleys there, you could have pulleys back here, and then you could have your tetherings part way down here on the wall. And you'd be able to just like pull down and hook it. And that would be great to get the rack out of the way. And then when you're done, you would unhook it and raise it up and put on the next hook. And now it's sitting there. And you could even have a lower hook if you want to bring it down really low for some reason. But that would be my suggestion. Um, looking up, oh, sorry, I didn't mean I left, I didn't realize I left it on the screen that long. Looking to upgrade a six foot long tank here soon. Should I get one massive light like the Geisman or a combination? Hmm. It comes down to what you're going to see. Is this going to be something in full view? Is it hidden in a canopy? You know, is it wrapped with some kind of beautiful trim? Or are you looking at the aesthetics of a beautiful light fixture to get you that sleek, sexy look? You know, a lot of times in the past when we were thinking about certain light fixtures, Elos was the one everyone wanted to match because Elos looked so clean. Geisman, another very clean light fixture. If you could go that route, you'd probably really appreciate that one. But it, it also comes down to a combination of what can you fix when something breaks? In an all-in-one unit, if something burns out, half your light goes down and then you're kind of up a creek, especially if you have to mail it in to get it repaired. Now, if you can open it up and replace a part, that's a little bit better. But... Uh, I kind of like the idea of having separate pieces that I can deal with one at a time or replace something that broke. Okay, let's talk about some water quality here for a second. So Nicole has had high calcium and high magnesium for over a month. And it's really hard to bring it down if there's nothing in your tank absorbing it. Now, what made those numbers so high in the first place? Did you overdose? Is it the salt mix you're using just really mixes that high in the first place? Or is it your test kits are wrong and you're just being misled to think it's a really high number when it's not that bad. But typically dilution is a solution to pollution and that also works with uh, numbers that are too high like alkalinity and calcium. And what you can do is you can go ahead and do some water changes to bring it down. But what you have to do is you need to test the salt water you've mixed and see what the alkalinity and the calcium are in the magnesium. And if those three are lower than your tank, then yeah, the bigger the water changes, the more the number will come down. But if it's, if what you've mixed up is really high in magnesium and calcium and alkalinity, then it doesn't matter how many water changes you do because you keep putting in the same high number all the time. You'll, you'll never win that battle. Isn't that funny? Uh, here Victoria made the point, you know, about the T5s and just by turning the fixture around to reorient the lighting so you're looking at a different row of bubble, uh, bubbles, a different row of light bulbs changes your perspective. So yeah, sometimes it really comes down to which order of bulbs you're looking at when you look at a tank. That was funny that you just turned it around. I like that. I would have taken it apart and switched all the bulbs out and looked again and kept switching until I found the right combo. There used to be this guy years ago, I think his name was Grim Reefer on a forum and he was the T5 expert and everyone always wrote to him and said what do I need and in what order and how many watts and he answered everyone so anytime anyone asked me the question I pointed them to this guy so I never learned it myself because I wasn't running T5s hmm best shoaling fish for a mixed reef well honestly my favorite is going to be liar tail anthias, and they're gorgeous. Got to feed them a lot, but they're so beautiful, and they're always out in the open, and they have the uh, purple eyes, so they remind me of Cleopatra. I, I think they're gorgeous, and you can get a whole bunch of those in one male, and you can have a really pretty collection. It's expensive, but it's a really nice combination. <laughs> no, I have never had the police come out here because of my tank. I've had them come out for lots of other reasons, but it was never the blue lighting. One time they came out because I set off the alarm and I didn't even know I'd set the alarm off. And they knocked on the door and I was like, I opened the door and I'm like, yes. 
and they said, who are you? And give us your ID. And I was like, okay, I did all that. And they was like, well, it's obviously your house. I'm like, yeah, you want to see my reef? And they came in. I'm like, oh my God. And they loved it. But no, I've never had that. I did have a, I do have a funny story that I think I've shared once before where I was working my driveway and I was building this room and I was putting up the walls and I was out there, you know, with a, a trim saw and a skill saw and a sawzall and, you know, all this lumber and all these wires and all the lights were on it. This was late at night. I mean, probably 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, I was using the floodlights on my driveway to see what I was doing. And I was out there cutting lumber and <laughs> building my room. And a cop pulled up, didn't even get out. He just rolled down the window and, you know, basically waved me over. So I told him, hi. And he said, um, any noise complaints? And I like, no, my neighbors are nice and quiet. <laughs> and he said, I'm talking about you. And I was like, no. <laughs> And that was great. I was just like, why would they complain? It's a Friday night. That's the night everyone parties. You know, if I'm out here cutting some wood, who cares? And uh, yeah, that was really, really funny. He asked me if there was any noise complaints. So I never forgot that story. My lights are pretty much contained in the center of my house. If you're in the back, you can definitely see the blue glow. But from the front, it's really not that obvious. Uh, Adam's back to the 7,000 Kelvin. I just want to answer this really quick. Yes, corals will grow under that hideous color. <laughs> uh, people in the old days were growing corals like crazy under 6,500 Kelvin, which is daylight. And they would put those bulbs over their tank and they'd add a bunch of alkalinity and they grew the corals like crazy. And then after two months of massive growth, then they'd put them under a 20K bulb to make them look the right color so they could sell them. So... You know, if, if you like the look, I mean, why are you using this color? Why, what, what are you doing? Where do you live where they don't have regular uh, spectrum bulbs for aquariums? I mean, if, are you just trying to buy something at Home Depot and just make it work? Because you can, but I don't think you'll be happy. How do you lower ammonia with no water changes? Why do you have ammonia in your tank is the question we all are going to ask you. And it, if it's a tank that's cycling, that will come down on its own. And if it's an existing tank full of ammonia, something has died and you need to remove it. Or your test kit is bad and you need to replace it. Uh, this is a good question. Nicole asks, uh, I keep hearing about shadowing of corals. And is angling the lights, could that help? There's a lot of different tricks we've done over the years. There was even light movers that would take your light and you would just literally move it super slowly across the reef all day long. Even slower than this, obviously, because I'm trying to demonstrate in time lapse. <laughs> and that was one way to kind of avoid shadowing. I always thought it'd be kind of cool to have some kind of an arc over the top of the tank and the lights would roll across the arc and go higher and then come back down lower. I thought that'd be nifty and it could do this back and forth thing all day long. But, uh, and that way you're kind of hitting the, you know, the light would be turning as it's going over the arc. You know, it's shining down and then it's shining at an angle and then it's shining this way. See, I thought that would be kind of neat. But I've also thought about the crazy notion, which I don't think anyone will ever do, where you can take a light and like hang it in front of the tank, shining at the glass for a couple of hours every day. And what, what benefit would you derive from that? Or would it just drive you insane having to deal with this hassle factor of installing this apparatus every single day and putting it in front of your tank and moving it over and moving it over and like, okay, and put it away. But maybe you'll get this really cool looking reef from the front because you've been hitting it from above and from the front for a period of two or three months. Maybe someone will test that out someday and let me know how it goes. I've heard that sand substrate can eventually cause crashes. How do you feel about that? I disagree. I don't believe that's true at all. I think that a lot of times, anytime there is a problem with a tank and they deal with destruction, um, it's usually due to laziness and neglect. And I have taken down several tanks, unfortunately, that have leaked over the years. And every single time, I just pulled out dirty sand. I did not find big pockets of black death sulfuric stuff. I just had dirty sand with detritus. And, you know, I've 
I've told you guys, I've never had any tanks crash that I own. So if people are gonna say, oh, the sand beds will crash the tank, I'd like to know where that data comes from. And that could just be something they heard and they've been repeating it ever since, sort of like a myth, but I don't know of that specifically. You can, from time to time, actually remove the sand bed and wash it and replace it. Um, most people won't ever do that job unless maybe they're moving their tank to a new location. That is the perfect time to do it. Or they're setting up a new tank, and so they want to wash the old sand. But no, I don't think so. I mean, my 280 was gorgeous, and it was six years old. And there was no surprises, just the silicone was letting go, so I had no choice but to take the tank down. My little uh, microphone is blinking red at me. It makes me nervous. Hey, we're almost done. We've been at this for about an hour. We should wrap this up. I see one more question here. We're talking about phosphates. So I have a nano tank, 15 gallons. How do I lower my phosphate? I do a two and a half gallon water change weekly and I'm running Fosgard. What is your, oh, hang on. However, my phosphate does not go below 2.0. 2.0 is pretty high. So your tank is really, really small. Normally I would say, just use Phosphate RX, but a little concerned, your tank is too darn small. I think really big water changes back to back would help get those numbers down quicker. And you've got to realize that the phosphate is going to keep coming out of your sand and out of your rock because you let it get up so high. And then once you've got it down, it'll stay down. Uh, if you wanted to run Phosphate RX, I would almost like to see you create a rig next to the tank. So here's your tank. And then here's a bucket with a 10 micron filter sock in it. And you would pump water from, with a power head through some tubing into the bucket and then a bulkhead out the side of the bucket. This is a real DIY project. Have it go back into your tank. And now we can dose phosphate RX directly into the sock as the water's entering and let it capture all the phosphate out of the water. That would be the best solution. Okay, I love that. That's what you gotta do. <laughs> so I'm gonna repeat it because I know I said it kind of quick. You got a tank, small tank, put a bucket next to it. You got a 15 gallon tank, you just made it 20 gallons. Now, you need to lower it with 12 drops of Phosphate RX. I sell Phosphate RX, by the way, on my website, so you can get it from me, and I'll be happy to ship it your way. And then you're gonna put, and I sell the 10 micron sock too, you're gonna mount the sock inside that bucket, you're gonna run the tubing from the tank, so you got a power head, tubing goes into the sock, you drip the Phosphate RX directly in the sock, Water drains back out of that bucket somehow through a bulkhead, through some plumbing, and back into your tank. So it's becoming an external uh, secondary tank. It just increased your water volume. And you're only going to do this overnight. This is not like something you have to do, uh, you know, nonstop for days and days and drive yourself crazy. But you can do this once and then measure your phosphate the next day and see if they came down. And if they didn't come down enough, do it again the next day and do it again. But the sock is catching everything, so your livestock will be completely safe. So that would be my recommendation for you. Uh, someone just asked me if I ship to Brazil. Depends what you're asking for, but yes, uh, probably I do. So we just have to get the price of what it would cost. I tell you that price. If you say I love it, then I ship it your way. Oh man, I love my Apple Watch. Let me show you something else. This is way off topic. So Apple has a thing called activity. And you've got these graphs showing you your day and they track it from your watch all the time. It's always measuring, for example, it measures the calories of movement, exercise, I have zero minutes today, <laughs> and then how many times I've stood, you know, basically getting up every hour and standing up. And I'm standing this whole time, I should get a lot of credit, right? But here's the thing I really like, and I was just looking at this the other day. These are awards that I've been earning by uh, doing different challenges and I've been earning them over all this year. And there's a bunch I didn't get, but there's a bunch I got. And I'm like, this is really cool. So I really do enjoy the Apple Watch for that. It also lets me get messages on my phone. I get notifications from Facebook. Um, I can take a phone call on it. I can play music from it. Oh. I didn't get the first one. This is, I think this is maybe the two, or maybe it's the three. It's got the LTE built in, and I really love it. And I bought it originally for exercising because when I go to the gym, it tracked my heart rate and everything, which is awesome. I could literally check and see, okay, my heart rate's at 158. I gotta maintain that number. And that was my goal based on my trainer's recommendation. And uh, that was super awesome. But ever since, you know, it's still been so practical for so many other reasons. And I just 
can't imagine living without it. And I know that sounds like such a fanboy thing, but yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of it. I definitely recommend it. All right, guys. Um, have I put my watch in the water? No, I actually take it off and put it in my pocket. I just don't want to take the chance. I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, you know, they're waterproof. They show people swimming in it, but salt water is so corrosive. Why should I take a chance and destroy my watch? You know, I was like, eh, I'm not, I'm not inclined. Um, I'm sure there's people that probably swim in the ocean and have great stories about it. It just keeps working. I just, I'm just being careful, I guess. You know, it wasn't free. It cost me money and I'd like it to last as long as possible. So that's it for you, for everyone. We're going to hang up now. You know, we're going to end this thing because that microphone's going to die on us. I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas. I hope you get really cool things under your tree for your tank, of course. And uh, the next Saturday, I've got company in town. I'm buying a new vehicle. And so I've, I've flown in a friend to help haggle because I hate haggling. I'm going to let him haggle. And hopefully I'll have a brand new vehicle. But I do not believe there'll be a live stream next Saturday because, unless he wants to do it. You know, he says, hey, yeah, let's do this. It'll be fun. But odds are there won't be a stream. So I just want to wish you a Merry Christmas right now and a Happy New Year. I hope your tanks do really well during the holidays and that you get really cool presents. And I will see you guys online. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me in Club Me Loves Reef, which is my group. I'm there all the time. All right, guys. Bye.